Yes, welcome back everyone. We're back here in our studio round 22 and guess what everyone fans, uh, for everyone watching in and everyone out there that's subscribed and tuning in, uh, our guys are back. Ephraim's back, Dills is back and of course um, Korowurumu's here as well. So the boys are back from Samoa. Looks like Ephraim's been at the markets over there and picked up a Penrith Panthers top. Look at him go. Nah, bro, I'm a day one. I've had this since I was born, man. Don't you remember? Ah, uh, awesome, awesome. <laughs> nah, you're a crack up dude, all right? Uh, it's great. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, it's great to be back here in studio with everyone. So, um, you know, an awesome show coming up, round 22. Ephraim, again, like always, brother, bring us in. So we'll start off with the massive news from yesterday. Obviously, uh, some sad news, I guess, but also happy in a way. Uh, Sean Johnson is retiring at the end of the season for the Warriors. Um, obviously, he's a legend of the game, and it will be sad to see him go, but hopefully he can go out on a good one, eh? Yeah, I think this is, um, I guess it was breaking news, but it was something maybe like, uh, like for myself, if you've watched Sean over the years and you've watched him this year, something that... Um, most probably was inevitable, I think, for me. And, and I guess with injuries and what's happened this year for Sean and I'm not being able to play his best football, it's most probably something that got taken out of his hands, I think. But at the end of the day, um, the, everything that he's done, not only for you know the game here in New Zealand, all the kids and all the fans, but the, the game in Australia as well. He's obviously played at Cronulla uh, and done some good stuff over there. So, uh, you know, a great legacy, uh, a player that you know everyone looked up to. Uh, kids changed the game alongside, I think, when it comes to like big steps, long balls, similar to what Benji Marshall did when he came through. So, you know, a sad day for all the Warriors fans and all the kids. But, um, you know, uh, uh, not now another opportunity to go out on, on, on a high uh, and try and get some wins for the Warriors and then finish off the way he would like to finish off. But, um, you know, massive congratulations to Sean and everything that he's done, not only for the Warriors, Cronella, and obviously New Zealand as well in the international space. So, yeah, massive ups for Shawnee. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a sad time, but it's inevitable for any player that the, the time comes mm. when you've got to finish and uh, nobody gets to play the game forever as much as you want to, but um, Sean's come to that moment. And probably the shocking bit is how well he went last year mm. and how he reached those heights and got the team that close to get into the grand final. But then this year, with a combination of injuries and not quite hitting that form again, um, you can tend to get a bit frustrated and you know, the injury's probably taken its toll as well. And mentally, it's hard to get yourself up and, mm -hmm. and keep going for so long. But a huge, huge rep for him, rep for him for what he's done for our game. A bit what Blair is saying for you know, going to the Sharks, probably a little bit of a godsend for him. You know, as hard as it would have been to leave the Warriors and go there to get out of his comfort zone. You know, as late as it was in his career, he probably. Took some growing, some personal growth out of that. Came back and flourished. Came back such a better player for the Warriors mm -hmm. last year. But for what he's done for our game, he's been a highlight reel. He's really put our game on the map and he's been a, a wonderful character and a great ambassador for our game. For someone who's been in the game so long, never had any um, bad news, bad press. You know, always performed professionally, performed well. And one of those kids, you're talking about Benji Marshall, the steps, the flick passes, the highlight reels. He would have been one of those people that got kids talking about his name and wanting mm. to be him in the backyard and in the schoolyards. You know, everyone doing the step. Um, I'm Sean Johnson. Yeah, get in it. And that would have attracted people to our game, which would have helped our game grow. You know, we've not... We're, We've never been the biggest game in New Zealand and we've needed people like Sean and he's been a great ambassador for us. So um, I'm sure he's done enough for himself on the field mm. to be busy off it. You know, he'll find plenty of job offers and, and find what he wants to do and he'll be in a position where he can call his shots afterwards. But, yeah, there's five games to go for the Warriors and I'm sure he'll want to go out. They're not mathematically done at this moment in time. We'll talk a little bit about that later. So he'll want to give it his best shot. We've got four games to go with a bye. 
and want to give themselves the best opportunity to give him the best send off possible. Yeah, of course. Um, do you guys have any like favorite moments from his career? Perhaps uh, any highlights that you remember? Like, yeah, um, like I've played with Shawnee obviously at the Warriors and in the Kiwi space. A um, couple that stand out to me. Um, there was a game we played against Canberra Raiders, and he had to hit two job kicks to give us the lead and win the game. And uh, Sean hit those two. Those are really memorable moments, I think. But then the other one that stands out to me. Most probably, and I didn't plan that World Cup, was the, the try that he scores at the end there against the English guy. Steps someone, Sam Burgess comes out of the line, has whack whack and scores a try and, and puts them into the grand final in the World Cup. So I think those are some of the highlights when you look back on Sean's career and you see some of them when he was young. Those, those are pretty similar highlights to where he was uh, you know, at the back end of his career. So, yeah, a couple of those moments for me. And obviously, you know, on the scenes come the 2011 into the grand final, the Melbourne game. Um, you know, they, they put themselves into the, the shop window, uh, coming in the eighth position, position on the ladder, beat the Melbourne Storm down there, then go into a, a grand final on the back of some of his work. Yeah, the one at Wembley was one of mine. Um, World Cup semi final, mm. playing the home nation at Wembley. Game's almost gone. There was 15, 20 seconds to go, and Sean gets a wide ball of Frank Paul Nuasala does a big step on one of the English defenders and runs it home to win the game, put New Zealand in the final the next week at, at Old Trafford against Australia. So, yeah, that was a real highlight moment for me as far as New Zealand's concerned. But, yeah, since I've been back, probably uh, winning the game against the Sharks last year when they had no right mm. to win the game. But it, uh, it signified a moment when there was a different Warriors team to what had been traditionally in the competition. They had a real strong resilience to come back from behind and he led that. So yeah, uh, all respect to Sean Johnson for his uh, rugby league career, but it looks like he might be getting into a new career uh, as our competitor. So just watch out, Sean, because <laughs> we're going to be on your case as a, as a mm. podcaster now as well. Um, but also for the Warriors, and you obviously know this very well, Adam, mm. because... <laughs> in your hard mahi that you're always doing, uh, you broke the story. Oh, bloody hell. So Jazz Tavanga is also set to leave the Warriors at yeah. the end of this season. Not sure what he's going to be doing if if he's retiring or not. He might be headed to a different club, but another club legend as well that's on his way out. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, like you said, I wasn't – the show's not to break, <laughs> to break the news like that, but the news that Jazz spoke to us on the other, the other show that I do um, – you know, the question was, you know, what, is, what does the future hold for Jay Stavanger? And he said that, you know, his mutual agreement, he's left the, the club have, and him have split ways or parted ways and he's looking for another opportunity. Um, and, and I spoke on there about, um, I guess, his mentality as a player and me being able to play alongside him and what I expected from Jazz every week. And I think there's, there was another quote from Sean, uh, from Stephen Cooney about, you know, how he sees Jazz as a player. And he said he was like a dog to the bone or like a junkyard dog. Um, he just chased everything. He, he was all hard and effort for a small guy. He also said he had not much talent uh, or a passing <laughs> game. But what he did have was the hunger and the desire to to be the best player on the field for his teammates. And um, they'll definitely miss someone like him. But I think there's plenty of clubs, not only here in, uh, in the NRL, but also overseas that could do with someone like Jazz and, and what he brings to the game. And I think when you look at the game, the game's moving really quick. So a lot of these guys that have been around for a while in the NRL have come through the transitions of where this game's going. And, you know, I finished in 2020, they brought in the six again rule, the, the, the new rule then, and it's only gotten quick and quick every year. So these older guys, or well, these guys have come through those eras, it's starting to move past them into these smaller guys. And we've spoke about this a lot, someone like Keanu Kenny, or all these smaller fast footwork uh, ad line runners, Dylan Walker, are starting to come into their own now. The guys that don't have that footwork are starting to get left behind. And someone like Jazz, although he's a tough player, the game may have just gone past what he can bring now. And I think you've got to be able to, someone of his position, got to have a pass, you've got to have vision, you've got to be a link between the halves. Is he a front rower? Is he a middle player? Is he a hooker? I think that's been to his detriment that he, he hasn't really um, settled into one position. He's been a every man player, that everywhere player where the coach has just gone, stick him on the field, he gets a job done for you. But at the same time, when you're looking for opportunities in clubs, um, 
these guys are now looking for those middle players of quick speed, footwork over the ad line, who's got a pass that it can actually play eyes up and see what's in front of you. I just haven't seen Jazz do that this year or a fair bit of his career. He's always been, like people have said, the junkyard dog, like the guy that you want to play with and work really hard. So, uh, you know, it's, it's disappointing because he's put his body on line for the club, but at some stage in your career, you're not always going to be there. That, that one team or one club player, you're going to have to look for opportunities. And Daz, I don't think you'll find it hard to find an opportunity somewhere else. Yeah, there's a couple of things. He's he's a bit of a throwback mm. you know, to, to the old days where middles just punch through and played hard and give everything they got. He plays way above his size mm. and weight. And um, he puts some of the bigger players to shame. Yeah. The way he plays, you know, and the aggression that he plays with. Um, he's all heart. And, you know, you can just imagine if he had a, another couple of inches on him, how dangerous he would have mm. been and how far he could have taken his career. Talk about him not having much skill, but he had so much more in other areas mm. of the game. And that'll be missed. But it, as Blair said, the game is changing. It's ever-evolving. And whilst his versatility has got him on the on the team sheet every single week when he's been available and fit yeah it has hurt him a little bit because he's you know he's a jack of all trades but mm. hasn't really mastered one yet but at 28 he'll pick up another job somewhere and that may well be in the UK he can still learn some some decent coin and go over there and um have a good career mm. he's still got some good years ahead of him um it's not the end and the other side of it is when you've been somewhere for so long, you know, sometimes you need refreshing. Sometimes you need that change to boost. He may not realise it right now. He may not see it that way. But when he gets his next gig and he goes into the club and he gets himself settled in. Oh, <laughs> we're talking about the Panthers. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, wherever he goes, he'll realise, you know, it's a, it's a refreshing start for him again. And his career could very well kick on because of that as well. You can get comfortable and comfortability can bring staleness and complacency, whereas change can re-motivate and reinvigorate him. I wish him all the best for whatever he does. He's been a, another great servant to the game and the club. He might be knocking on your door for some connections in the UK too, will he? Give us a call. Give us a call. <laughs> Jazz. I only charge 10% there? cuz. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. He's taking some commission too. How good. So the Warriors have two uh, big names leaving at the end of this season, which means that they're probably going to have to start bringing in some new names. And mm. speaking of bringing in new names, uh, the registrations for their youth teams have yeah. opened up. Well, they've opened up for Jersey Flag and yeah. are opening up for SG Ball and Harold Matz uh, next week. Yeah. So if you're a young kid, I think Adam can tell you all about this, but... There's opportunities. Yeah, and then this is the biggest thing for the Warriors is obviously the pathways. The pathways are creating more opportunities for the guys, and you've seen it through uh, this year and the amount of players that have come from New South Wales Cup into the NRL and got their opportunities, but also how good the Harold Mats went this uh, this year and how they won the competition first year and uh, beating the Bulldogs and the oh, beating who did they play in the finals? No, it was the Bulldog Magpies. Magpies, the Magpies, the Magpies the beating the Magpies in the final. Um, so it's a great opportunity for the kids out there to, to register into these things. 21s are open now, so it's making sure that you jump in and, and register your name and, and filling out all the links, but also keeping a track on like future Warriors, I think it is on Instagram or anything to do with the Warriors website. And then obviously the Harold Mats and the SG Ball open up on the 12th. So um, it's a great opportunity for those kids all over New Zealand to put their hand up and try and register. Hey, it's an opportunity. That's all they're giving. They're giving opportunities. At the end of the day, you have to show what you can deliver and what you got. And um, it's great that the, the Warriors have opened these up for, for all our kids here in Aotearoa. So, but again, even in Aotearoa, these guys come back from Australia. Like guys that have left home through, I guess, the COVID periods when there was opportunities not here, but over in Australia, they may want to come home back to New Zealand and, and be a part of these pathways. Mm -hmm. So those guys over there, now there is opportunities for those guys. So the more we can push it, the better the opportunity is for everyone here in, in New Zealand. So it's great, great that the Warriors have opened up those trials. Yeah, and that was part of the reasoning that the Warriors applied to have the Harold Mats and SG Ball and have those sides through as the pathways so they could keep some of those young fellas here, but also create the opportunities for our younger players 
and young athletes from outside the game who want to try and pick up and think they can start in a career in rugby league to get on that pathway and begin a possible career. Now, this opens the door for that to happen. The team, the club have provided the teams, and so the players have got to come in now. They're opening the door for to invite as many people to come in and then let the club have a look at you. Your time might not be now, mm. but these these uh, trials and these registrations will open again in the future. So good on the club. They're creating the pathway. They're creating the opportunities, and uh, they're there now that they haven't had in the past. So all the players that we've lost over the years to Australia, hopefully this stems the flow of some of that. Well, it's even even all our um, our rugby union kids um, because the the competition of union finishes before they even start their preseason. I think preseason for all these grades start from November. The competition finishes if you make the grand final in Harold Matz and SG Ball, which some of these kids are still at still at school and still playing rugby. You finish, I think, the last games maybe the twenty first of April. So it's just before you start your rugby season. So it's open to those kids as well. It is. The, and all you're doing is just sharpening your tool. You, your, this, all the skills are transferable. Um, it just means that you're continuously playing all year round. You, you're playing union at school, and then after union, you're straight into, like, if you can get picked up into these pathways, you're straight into your league, and then you finish up and you're pretty much into, into rugby again. So I don't know. If you, I don't think you can get burnt out as a kid because I reckon I did everything as a kid. You know, from waking up early milking cows to running the from to running the roads to drive traveling to Whangarei to get opportunities every single weekend. There's no such thing as getting burnt out at a young age. You just go out there and give yourself your all. So it's open to those kids too. So if they, if if there's rugby kids out there thinking it's going to be a conflict in your your careers or your rugby. Well, it's not because it's at different times of the year. So for all those rugby players too, all those kids that have that inkling of wanting to test themselves uh, here in, um, you know, league, then go and register, get in there. Yeah, as Blairy alluded to, there's no better selling point to a young player to come to your club by telling them we are a club that gives opportunities to younger players. And that's what they've done this year. Mm. They've opened the door for so many of that in a New South Wales Cup side. You know, Ali Lautau has had so many games. Leka Halasima, he's played some games this year. Moala Graham Tolfa. Those young fellas are getting opportunities. You know, if you come and join us as a club, you'll be afforded the same opportunities if you earn them. And then the thing, just lastly, and the thing with that, uh, Willie, is that you're only a kid, you don't have to make decisions whether this is going to be your career. Like I said earlier, it's sharpening your tools so you can be best at both rugby league, basketball, whatever you're playing, but you're giving yourself an opportunity to grow as a person, to grow your tools so that you can be better for whatever sports you choose. So while you're young, express yourself, take on these opportunities, go out there and, and play every single sport and, and give yourself the best opportunity to set yourself if this is set yourself up if this is the path you want to take. So no need to make decisions. Jump in, give it your best, and go out there and register. All of you kids, let's go. <laughs> uh, expanding our horizons to the rest of the NRL outside of the Warriors. There has been some chaos on the transfer market, that's for sure. All around the NRL, there's stuff going on. So I'll just give you a bit of a pick and mix here of all the different things that's been happening. So Stefano Tukumanu is going to the Ooh, Storm three-year deal. Uh, Brian Tuttle was rumoured to be going to the Tigers. Uh, that's been squashed. Corey Horsburgh has requested an immediate release after getting basically demoted back to yep. a permanent resident of their New South Wales Cup team. Uh, Blaze is going oh. to the best team in the NRL for a three-year contract. Is that confirmed? Yeah, that's confirmed. <laughs> ah, pretty beautiful, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> anyway, joke. sorry, before yep. I get into it... Uh, Remus Smith, immediate release from the storm. He's moving along to the Catalan Dragons as well, along with uh, some of those other boys that we've talked about before. And Taniela Paseca extended at the Seagulls till 2029. They like doing those long contracts. So Don't they? what do you guys think about some of these massive moves that have been going on? Well, I think the biggest news was Blaze Taolangi. Um, the, it, they're saying, obviously, the best young product coming through their pathways from all age groups. SG Ball win last year, I think, and then coming into the NRL and pretty much, I think, has been a, a standout and can play a few positions. Um, so to lose someone of his calibre, 
huge news. Um, and going to, I guess, the rivals, uh, the Penrith Panthers out west, even more so. But I get, I see it from, I guess, his point of view, but I, you know, from a fan and being an, uh, if you're a Parramatta supporter, you'd be so disappointed that you weren't able to keep one of your best young talents coming through. And, and I think he's a six. I think he's a great six. I think he's a great half and he's strong, he's tough. Um, so I think out of the, all the news alongside, obviously, Stefano, Blaze was the biggest one. I think Stefano, awesome. I like that signing. I think, you know, a kid that's, and, and we said it from the start, he, he, he said that he was going out to look and the club gave him an opportunity to go out there and we said he won't be coming back to the Tigers um, here on the show. But to go to a club like the Melbourne Storm only is going to help his career um, he's chasing, obviously, finals football. Uh, he wants to be the best player, front rower in the competition. And most really get back to the form that found him in that New South Wales space. And I think going down there will only help him and strengthen his knowledge of the game, but also uh, give him the tools to be better as a player, as a person. So massive signing for the Storms, grabbing him. I know, obviously, Nelson, there's still conversation around Nelson, where, whether he's going to be there or not, or if they've found places for him to go. But... You imagine those big boys through the middle of the park. Uh, I think they'll do a really good job. And, you know, when one, one door closes, another one opens. And the same thing, the Melbourne Storm just keep rolling them over alongside Penrith Panthers, who are just picking up everyone at the moment, both clubs, and doing the right thing. But when you say picking up, when I say picking up everyone, they're picking up the right players that suit them. And I think, you know, someone like Blaze to the Penrith Panthers and obviously Isaiah Papali'i as well. Um, Stefano is a great signing for the Storm. Yeah. <laughs> I feel for Jason Riles. He's mm -hmm. walking into a storm mm -hmm. at, at the Parramatta Hills. But, yeah, we spoke about it a while ago and we've been talking about it for a long time. Someone like Blaze Talangi wanted to know who the coach was a while ago mm -hmm. and they kept dragging their heels on it. And these things, these decisions aren't made overnight. So whilst the Parramatta Hills are dragging their heels on a coach... I dare say his agents out there having these conversations and um, I dare say it would have been close to being a done deal um, a little while ago. That's just how these things work. So it's a great sign, a great pickup for the Panthers. Whether they use him as a replacement for Jerome Luai to play at six, I'm not mm. too sure. Um, regardless, they've got a great athlete on their on their books for next season and he's, he's a big, big loss for the Parramatta Eels and what Jason Rolls will want to try and build, not just for next year, but for the future and going forward. The Melbourne Storm, we, we spoke about how it would have been a great place to go for Tavita Pangai Jr. Mm. and even mm -hmm. Josh Schuster mm -hmm. early in the season because of the environment, because of the culture, because of the coaching, because of what they instill in players, both character-wise, culturally, but rugby league-wise, what they teach you. You learn your craft. You learn how to grow. That's what's going to happen for Stefano. Stefano's going to go down there and become such a better player. I think it's such a, a great signing. It's, as Blairy will attest to, and I've only heard about, it's a tough place. It's a, it's a tough place to go down and work and learn, but you do become a better player, a tougher mm. player mentally as well as physically. But I like the fact that Stefano's taken that challenge because he's decided to leave the Tigers to chase some success. Mm. He's ambitious. And that's what this signing and going to Melbourne shows me that he truly is ambitious about making himself better, but also joining an organisation that's going to challenge. And hopefully um, he gets himself in the position where he can play more Origin games mm. and challenge for grand finals. He's a great kid. I've said this before. He's a wonderful kid. Uh, he'll be great for the Melbourne Storm and the Melbourne Storm will be great for Stefano. Mm. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's an interesting contrast with Stefano <clears throat> and then compared <coughs> to the other guy that I said about uh, Corey Horsburgh. Both yeah. of them debuted in Origin last year, their first game, yeah. one game Origin players. And then uh, the comparison is just like that. Like, like what? Stefano's what on the up. He's been, they were desperate to keep him at the Tigers. He's gone and used his leverage to get you know, as Adam always says, one of the best gigs you can as a young player. And then Corey Horsburgh, they they don't want him at all at the Raiders, it mm. seems like, at this point, and he's desperate to get out. So just a interesting one for 
the that that just be, must be the new South spirit, you know, uh, of Stefano. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the Storm just build foundations, bro. They just build foundations of what it takes to be a rugby league player. And like Willie said, not only culture but professionalism, like good people. You know what I mean? They don't just grab anyone down at their place. They choose people that are going to fit into a, a system and a culture that represents to the highest end of a Melbourne Storm player. Because once you become a Melbourne Storm player, you're always a Melbourne Storm player down there. No matter how many games you play, one, two, or 150, you're always going to be a, a Melbourne Storm player. And they, you know, and prime example, Ali Katoa, I think, um, coming through the New Zealand pathway, is very young through rugby and then straight into league. And really the game kind of snuck past him, went down to Melbourne Storm for an opportunity to build those foundations and he's been a revelation then at the Storm. So I think Stefano can do something similar and geez, it would be nice to watch him go on and become a, a New South Wales player because I think he's a big, strong kid, great player and I think he'd only get better down at the Melbourne Storm. So we will move on to our last bit of news uh, to do with refereeing, everyone's favourite topic to dis <laughs> discuss. Um, so basically Casey Badger... Uh, has been officially banned from refereeing or taking any part in the refereeing team, bunker or such, from South Sydney Rabbitohs games uh, after it's, well, come into the public conscience that her husband yeah. actually is their refereeing consultant at the club. Uh, so she just ref there, or was the bunker, I believe, in their game against the Sharks this weekend gone by, which the Rabbitohs lost. So, I mean, I don't know if it's really that big of a deal, but... Yes, she has been officially banned. Is that a fair call from the NRL to do that? Well, I think it's more mostly a, it's a perception as well, you know what I mean? Like you said, the fans are, are noticing something and whether it's not, uh, it's for her, it's her job and for, for Badge, it's his job, um, Gavin. I think, you know, the perception is mostly stronger and I guess the conflict that the NRL don't want to have is people saying that there's a bit of a bias out there when it comes to things because I remember they did that when the Warriors and Jason Paris come out and said similar things, you know what I mean? So I think they want to avoid all that kind of conflict. I think it's great. I think, you know, the NRL have done the right thing here is just taking, them, taking her away from any Souths game. Uh, most clubs have uh, ex-referees, I think. It's more around getting a, a better understanding of what refs are looking for uh, in games and how they referee things, so if, if, especially if you've been in the game for so long, um, you, be, you you notice the trends and what refs are looking for. So to have someone like Badge help them and support and guide uh, one day a week at training actually helps the team get a bit of understanding, especially when all these new rule changes come in and, and they're asking questions around what is what are the risks looking for around these new new rule changes. This is about being a, ahead of the game. It's been about understanding, you know, the trends of what refs not like to look for and why they're gonna penalize these things. So it's not it's not uncommon knowledge that there are refs that come along to training sessions to give this feedback to give them an understanding of what it is because the NRL, oh, the, the NRL clubs are wanting to know, you know, what refs are looking for in these games, which then gives them a little bit of an advantage when they get out mm -hmm. in the field, so what to look for. So I think they've done the right thing, just take her off all the South stuff and um, it's all done. Yeah, just avoid any controversy, just stay away from it um, rather than let it go and then something happen mm, that yeah. may be incidental and become a storm in a teacup, it's a storm anyway. Avoid that happening. With, so you don't have to put any fires out. Just step away. You're not doing South Sydney games from now on whilst your husband's working there. And you can do all the other games. And I, I think it's a smart move from the NRL. They're saving themselves from any hassle. Sweet as. And with that, we'll move on to the games for the week. So starting off with the Thursday night game, Tigers versus <coughs> Cowboys at Leichhardt Oval, 48-30 to the Cowboys. And same old story for the Tigers. Again, someone sent off, this time a red for Justin Olam, and it cost them the game. Yeah, I think I gave up on the Tigers after um, they, he got the 12 men down and, and most probably thought the same thing like everyone are, same old West Tigers. Um, but between all their young players, and we've said it before on the show, and when they played against the Warriors, they're, they're, they're a great attacking side, and we've always said that they needed to fix up their defence. But you come up against another great attacking side of the Cowboys. Yes, the game was in the balance, and they hung tough. And Benji Marshall said about resilience, they could have easily just rolled over and just gave up more points than what they did. 
But I think he said he was proud of, I guess, their attitude to keep working hard right to the last minute and, and made it a bit more of a contest, contest when it comes to the Cowboys because I thought, yeah, they'll run away with the drink water was outstanding, being and everything, attacking players all over the field. But they, they made it a contest in the end, contest in the, end the, the Tigers, and really put it to... The Cowboys, the Cowboys only in the back end there just snuck away for a few late tries and, you know, a ball went on the ground to, to push it out and, you know, goes down and scores a try in the corner. But, again, like you said, it, it's the old red card. And I reckon that's controversial too. I think there's there's plenty of games over the weekend that I saw that could have got a similar reaction. But sometimes when you're the first game of the week, it kind of sets precedence for the weekend's games, eh? And I reckon playing on the Thursday night, you get the understanding of what the refs, if the refs pull up something on a, on a Thursday, you kind of know what's going to happen over the weekend and they try they they set the trend for the weekend's game. So I think that was like, everyone was like, oh no, that shouldn't have been a penalty. And then two other incidents like that happened over the weekend and they just play on, yeah. you know, go and report and, and do those things. So very unlucky there, the West Tigers. Yes, they turned up, they should be proud. Benji was proud of them. They're resilient in some tough circumstances, but the Cowboys for me, um, needed to come out and put a score line, especially in their four and against as well in this competition. Yeah. <laughs> See, we say it every single week. Discipline's hurting the, the Tigers again. And defensively, um, still not showing up. Mm. Dangerous with the ball. I thought um, Galvin was outstanding. He's going to be a class act going forward for them. And for any success in the future, they've got to keep this young team together mm. as much as possible. They've lost to Fano. They've lost uh, Papali'i. They can't lose it too many more. They've got to try and do their best to keep this team together, especially with um, Jerome Lua and Sunia Taruva mm. coming across to join them. But, yeah, just the Cowboys, I thought uh, Dearden was outstanding yeah. for them, both defensively and attacking-wise. They took their opportunities at the right time. They're on a bit of a run now, the Cowboys, and I think they could uh, shake things up if they get – Confidence going towards the eight, and you know they're they're starting to find some real form. And Todd Payton's done a really good job to to keep his team together through some trying times there. But they've got their big guns back. Nanai's back. Talangi's uh, Murray Talangi's back. Valentine Holmes looking dangerous out on mm. that left edge again, kicking well, regardless of whether he's talking about leaving or not. Um, they're getting things done on the field. So yeah. A tough one again for the Tigers. I just don't know when their next win's going to be. I hope they do get one or two before the season's out, but I just can't see it the way they defend at the moment. So much, and I'll speak a lot about this this morning, um, defence is the key. Mm. Defence is the key at the moment. There's some really strong attacking teams, but the two teams that are defending the best, they're at the top of the table. The, uh, the Tigers are four points back on the ladder from the Eels at the moment oh, yeah. uh, with a bye in hand. So two points back technically. Yep. Can they, can they do it like you just said? Do, do you think, what is the percentage chance that you'd give the Tigers to not get the wooden spoon from their position that they're in right now? I'd give them a 30% chance. 30% chance to get that win. They've got to tie Parramatta first and then they, try and jump them. They play, they play t Parramatta, don't they? Yeah, last, last, 27. last game. Last game of the so, season, yeah. So I reckon it will come down to that last game, which will be an interesting game, yeah, wouldn't yeah, it? It'll be, I think everyone will be watching that too as well because of the whole purpose and the reason that it's for the wooden spoon. And I think, you know, alongside watching what Parramatta did on Friday night, the Tigers, both teams are outstanding in attack. I thought Parramatta's defence was what won them the game. On, on Friday night, but um, they're both two teams that can upset the table, and I think when you take into con uh, take into consideration that they can be the spoilers of the competition, and that's how you kind of run your last few games when you when you where you are on the on the ladder, and you can't really you're playing for wooden spoon, but you're also playing to spoil other teams' opportunities in the eight, and I think Parramatta did that. Um, I think both teams would be doing the same thing if they have that mindset of sorting out. I guess that defence and making sure that when they go and play, they're playing with everything. I guess Paramount's in a different situation. They're, they're uh, playing for jobs as well. You know, new coach coming in, so everyone has to put their hand up. But I think that last game, I think it's going to come down to that to that last game, bro, to be honest. Yeah, just on the Olam one, um, I think it's an area of the game that centres really need to practice and practice hard. 
Um, Isaac Tungle had one mm. that he got penalised for yep. in the weekend. Um, obviously, there was um, Joseph Swali in, in Origin was think, the highlight one. I think Joe Manu got one as well. Joe Manu got one yeah. against uh, the Dolphins. So it's something, it's an area that centres will keep coming in and jamming and reading, but they've got to time their tackle. I can't remember his name, and forgive me for this, but there was a Dogs player early in the season who came up with a great hit. Yeah, it's great the, um, Skelton. Skelton. Yeah, Skelton. Skelton. Right, yeah. Skelton came up with a great perfect. hit. That's what it needs to be. And Blair, he said it was perfect at the time. That's what they've got to practice. Because anything around the shoulders that's sliding up and however incidental it is, mm. as soon as the shoulder's touching the chin, you're in trouble. Yeah, They're going for it. So you've got to set your targets lower. Yeah, I think, um, I guess, as centres, um, the whole role of a centre is to shut the play down, eh? And sometimes... You know, if you're just coming in to make a tackle, unless you're doing what Skelton done and, and you're coming in and just putting a, a perfect technique tackle on, the, the opportunity now is people to beat your feet, but also to get the offload away. So it's a it's a judgment call on how high you go and it's a, in an instant or in seconds uh, to make that decision and you get it wrong and that's what you get, a red card, you know what I mean? Or you get some penalties like we've seen on the weekend. So... If we can just do what Skelton, Skelton did and hit on the ball, um, then that would be the perfect way. Easy said than done. Uh, when the shape coming at you, I think the centre position is one of the hardest oh. positions to defend in because if you make a poor decision, it ends up being what we just seen with Olam. If you make the right decision, it's like you saw with Skelton, Skelton, but then also you can do and draw and pass or get beaten with feet and you must really get knocked out sometimes. So it's a tough position to defend in, but you've got to get it right because you don't want to be coming into finals football and losing your best centers in the competition or best centers in your team to a red card or, you know, time on the sidelines. So, yeah, a tough place to defend, but got to get needs, it right. Nate needs to get it right. Yeah, needs to get it right. Last one on the Cowboys. Um, Jake Granville picked up a pick injury in this uh, TBC on when he's going to be back, but... I saw articles saying it's possible yeah. that he might have to go into forced retirement. Uh, he's 35, I believe. Mm. There's another injury. I think he's had three injuries in this season only. Yeah. Uh, so that, that hopefully isn't the case for an old dog. Yeah. He, but I feel like he's been around for ages. Like you said, the old dog, 20, 35, played in most positions, missed the fix-it for, for the Cowboys over a long period of time. I think he was running around when I was running around. So the bro is old. Um but, you know, it would be sad to see him have to, you know, take that out of his hands and have to retire on the back of, you know, an injury because he has been a big part of, you know, the Cowboys. Yeah, every player wants to go out on their own terms. You want to finish on your own call when you're ready. And, and uh, from my, my own self career, um, I didn't have that. I got injured before the last game of the season. So I didn't get to finish, but thankfully Leeds allowed me to play on Boxing Day as a farewell game. So I got to do the build up and got to enjoy it with my kids and know that it was my last game. That's something you should be able to enjoy as a player and you want to. But um, you know, hopefully Jake Granville gets to enjoy that too. Someone who's had a storied career, um, a Cowboys legend, a grand final winner. Mm. You know, he's, he's done some great things, but on the other side of it, Sometimes your body tells you when it's time. Sometimes your body, it's a, it's a rigorous, tough game. And he's played it the toughest way by covering every position, playing in the middle. And a small man being in the middle, you target it every single week. And he fronts it up every mm. single time. And uh, maybe his body's just having a little whisper to him at the moment. Then that may be time. I hope he does come back before the end of the season and can call it quits if it's time for him and he decides it is to do it on his own on his own call uh, tough position to play man. nine in the middle of the park um, like you become a spot because of the type of the size you are you know what I mean so having to come out of the line and try and tackle guys twice your size or even bigger than you and put your body on your on the line for the, the years that he has mate enormous enormous for anyone 40 50 times a game you know oh you know you couldn't oh. think of anything worse like you'd be sore <laughs> after every single game and like I remember playing against him and he was a spot to build momentum off A, to get a quick play of the ball and get down because you knew you were going to get a legs tackle. He wasn't going to come out of line and shot you. You know what I mean? So you're safe to say that if you, if you go at him, you're going, to get, you're going to create momentum at times if you do it consistently enough. And he's got to make 40 to 50 tackles a game. Well, guys, the body will be sore. The body will be sore. But 
you know, credit to the him. Hopefully, it's not the end of it. <clears throat> Cowboys finals push to honour Jay Ooh. Granville incoming, perhaps. Uh, but anyways, we'll move on to uh, the next game: Warriors versus Eels uh, at home in New Zealand. Just mm. like us, we're back, everyone, Yo. again. Uh, <laughs> 30-20 to the Eels. It was a bit flattering of a scoreline, to be honest, if I'm being honest, because of those two late tries for the Warriors. The Eels were killing them early yeah. on. And, yeah, it's a bit of a rough one. Like Willie said earlier, not mathematically impossible now for the Warriors, but rough game, eh? Oh, tough, tough game. Um, but first of all, like, you know, obviously they've sold out every single game yes. this year. History, history made for the Warriors and... Um, that's massive for for an NRL club to sell it every single game, and for I guess the fans, you know, the the Warriors fans that have turned up consistently week in week out, rain, hail or sunshine, to uh, support their team uh, through the ups and downs and the roller coaster of being a Warriors fan or supporter, um, to be able to turn up on Friday night when they played against the Eels to try their hearts out, to chant, to bring all the signs, to bring their families along to try and get them home, um, you know. Massive congratulations to them, but they would have been disappointed after the game. So was, I guess, myself, you know, fans, uh, with what I saw out there. I just, you know, I think it's been the consistent trend for the Warriors this year is, you know, they just haven't been able to find their 80-minute performance yet. And if you look through the game, I think they started okay. They built pressure on the Parramatta Eels on their trial line, never managed to execute it and again you've got to give credit to the Parramatta Eels they came with a game plan to play some football which he kind of would have known that because they've got nothing to play for and you know they were they were enormous uh, the Parramatta Eels they they tightened up the defensive line they went after the Warriors when they attacked they attacked with width they attacked with shape they had offloads they had push support you know the one of Dejan Arce just pumping straight through the middle of them off a, a drop out most probably highlighted the season for me for the Warriors is there. there's always been moments uh, in games where they've just clocked off for that second and opportunities like that have been a, have aris, arose and they've scored from it, the opposition. So if they look back over their seasons, there's some games that would have got away from them uh, and some games they should have won and they didn't win. And this is most probably one of those ones where they should have turned up with, I guess, and I'm not saying they didn't turn up with the right attitude, but it didn't look like they turned up ready to play a tough game of football. And... When you get to those back ends or back end games of the season, um, what's going to hold you instead is your defence, and I just don't think it's been there all year for the Warriors defensively. And this game uh, is prime example. You know, some easy tries scored, uh, but you know to top it off, you know Dylan Brown sneaks through there, and I know they scored some late tries, but for me it was too late. Um, you know, I think they were down down with 20 minutes to go. Uh, I think they were down most of the game with 20 minutes to go and they still wanted to carry one out. And front rowers take a hit up. Uh, uh, you know, Chance, who tried his heart out, thought it was enormous in the game. One hit up, you know, Adam hit up, Dallin hit up, and then you got one shot and then it's kicked the ball to the corner. When the game was in the, on the line and you needed to play some football, they went the other way and just tucked the ball into the wing and just squeezed up, Parramatta squeezed up the defensive line, suffocated in the fence, and they weren't able to come away with the win. Scored some great tries at the end, but the game was done. At the end of the season, whatever your season is, if you haven't won the grand final, you look back and you reflect on the games that could have been, and I think the Warriors will look back, and there's been quite a few of those this season. Go back to the Gold Coast at home. Unfortunately, Xavier Coates scoring at Melbourne early in the season. Mm -hmm. Um, and I I pinpointed this block of three games mm. with the Raiders who had been struggling at home um, as, a, as a win for the Warriors, pre followed by the Tigers and mm. Para, the two bottom teams in a row. And I thought if the Warriors could get those six points, they're well back in it. Yep. But they walk away with two out of that possible six. Um, and with the last one probably being their most disappointing performance, mm. At home, in front of their crowd, as Blairy said, sold out, fans still turning up. But they were just off. They were off in so many areas. And the try that Joey Lussick scores, yeah. you have a look. They don't have a set line at the play that goes to the middle. They get beaten in the ruck by Joe Afangawe. He gets a quick play. The ball Joey Lussick gets out, beats the markers. A's not there. The fullback doesn't come up in the line mm. and just barges his way over the yeah. line. They just... Too many players missing the jump 
missing opportunities to tie on the line. The Blairy spoke about the dropout that Dejan Arce scored. And the dropout was neither one to get it back or to try and make a tackle. It was too far away. So moments, moments that counted against them. And in the NRL level, you get punished for it. And whether it's Parramatta who had them one in five or six games, they still came and they punished them. For what they did, Dylan Brown was outstanding. Gutherson mm. had his best game for a long time. Yeah, and Blaze Talangi was already spoken about his talents, you know, outstanding. And uh, uh, the Warriors really, really made it difficult now for themselves. Um, be such a massive turnaround if they're able to do this, but they need to be a far cry better than what they were on the weekend. Yeah, I think you know when you when I go back and think about it and watching the game. Um, clunkiness around the attack when they were going to the line. I think what happened was they lost Dylan Walker to an injury, but they said it was HIA. And I think he's kind of that glue to the middle of the park for them. And then when you're trying to ask Adam Fanua Blake, who his best option is just to carry the ball strong with his feet or using him up on like a decoy player, whether he has to, he demands people to get in front of him. When you have to use him as a ball player, when he doesn't necessarily ball play all the time, takes away his strength for the middle of the puck, but also takes away the connection that Dylan Walker has with the halves to get the ball to those guys with his quick light footwork over the ad line, which we've always spoken about with Dylan Walker, and he's been the difference for them through the middle of the park. They really missed him because I saw a lot of guys overrunning, you know, the the, the lines that they're running. I think I saw Le Kalesima being, you know, missing the timing of what he was trying to do outside Sean. I think, you know, that consistency of changing, you know, halves and stuff all the time. And, and, and again, you know, Sean's a, a world-class player. But if you haven't been ripping enough with those people in the squad, then... You can't expect to get it done properly on the field. And yes, they should know they're professional athletes. This is their job. But when pressure is put on from an actual team, and it's not just your your team at training defending you, when you're actually having to make tackles and you have to get your lines right, I just think that's where they got it wrong as well. And on the back of the defence was just not the best that I've seen this year. And I know, I think, you know, like like the best teams that are playing at the moment is the better defenders, the better defensive teams in the comp are sitting up on the top of the ladder. And, you know, you could add like the, the Bulldogs into that list as well of what they're doing. You can always tinker with your attack like the Bulldogs have. You can never, if you don't do, if you haven't built a culture around defence and you haven't built an attitude that you want to work hard for each other enough, then when it comes to these big games, you know, you can't expect people to turn off for each other when you haven't actually put the time and effort into your defensive uh, patterns and structures. Because I think if I go back to last year on the Warriors stuff, I thought they were really strong defensively. They turned up for each other. Whether they've got complacent or they've just thought it wasn't as important, we're going to make sure we get our attack right. I think all the attack comes on the back of a strong defensive team. And, you know, those, those teams at the top are showing why defence is so important, which... We know, Willie, um, defence. We already know that. We don't have to talk about how you know how far defensive teams go in the competition, but that's that's just common sense, you know what I mean? It's it's how the competition works. It's the best defensive team find themselves on the grand final day. So last week you guys called for um, Roger to be left at fullback and maybe a move for chance to centres or yep. something like that. They didn't. Do that. They left Chance as the fullback, and but this time instead of centers, they put Roger to the wing. How do you think that went? Yeah, them? yeah. Well, this was Chance's first game back. I thought he was enormous. Uh, they they both play a different style of football. You know what I mean? So it's a real hard position to put on the coach to be able to play them both in in the team. And um, like we said, if he's not a he's not a fullback, he's a winger. But do you get the same effect from him being on the wing that you do at, at fullback? I'd most probably say no after watching the weekend's game and watching his game before then. Um, but how do you leave Chance out? You know, with the what he the work rate that he does, and I'm not saying Roger doesn't do the same, but I just think that it's been a bit of an experiment the whole year for the Warriors, and it's most probably a hard place to sit for uh, Coach Webster because I know he would have promised someone like Chance that you're a fullback. Rogers had two years out of the game. He's our third string, you know, team to Opik, he's in front of Roger. Um, but we're all saying that he's a fullback and he's a world-class fullback and he was a Dally M fullback and that is his best position. How you fit him into the team, into that fullback position, like, you've got to find a way. Uh, whether it means moving 
uh, chance out of there. But it's not up for us to say. That's just our thoughts and our opinions. I just feel like his best position is a fullback, and we've seen it this year. Um, he may not have the ball playing abilities or skills, but what he what he brings is his work ethic and the the ability to break lines open with his footwork and his speed and his tenacity just to keep working hard for each other. Um, that's I guess that's his difference. That's his point of difference for me. When he signed last year, uh, when he re-signed for the Warriors, the question was, where was he going to fit in? Where is he going to play? At that moment in time, the whole back line for the Warriors, Rocco Berry, Adam Pompey, Montoya, Dallin Watini, Zelezniak, Chance, were killing it. Mm. They were flying. Mm -hmm. So where are you going to fit Roger in the, in the team? Unfortunately for Adam Pompey, it was at the expense of him. We're going to try and make him a centre. But the question's still there. People are still asking the question, you know, mm. where's Roger's best position? Mine, it's fullback. Mine, it, it is fullback. But you know, I understand giving Chance the opportunities, he's been injured. But I think for the side going forward, Chance will have to go to centre and Roger go to fullback. Mm -hmm. That break that he made last week, and I alluded it to, to it last week against the Tigers, picks up the ball on his try line, he runs to the 50-metre line, quick play the ball, uh, Dallin scores down the right-hand side. He knows where to be. He knows how to play fullback. You know, it's, it's instinctive to him. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, it, it just comes to him naturally, and he knows how to defend. He's got the work ethic. Nothing against chance. Mm. Nothing at all against him doing that. But that's Roger's best position. And I, th I think that's, for mine, where he's got to be. He's great on the wing. He's a much better winger than a centre, granted. Yep. I'll give you that. Mm. But, and again, I said it before, a full credit to Roger for taking it all on the chin and, and doing what's right for the team. And that's what you expect out of your senior players, mm. and he's been great at it. But, that, again, Blair said, that's just my opinion. That's yeah. my opinion. Uh, be I so, think it should fit. There'd be so many different opinions on, on 100%. Roger. 100%. Uh, and the biggest one, I, the biggest divide I see on Roger is he's not a ball-playing fullback, but he makes up for it in every other way, I think. And both Willie and I, and, mo and half most probably of New Zealand, most probably think he's a fullback, yep. uh, which is his best position, which has shown and proven over his time in the game. So again, the best place for him moving forward is, I think, and for the Warriors, is fullback. Um, but then you say, you're saying move Chans into centres. There are some good kids who are playing centres right now who are the future. Do we, do we leave them out because you want to fit Chans into the team? Um, or, you know what I mean? Or where does Chans go to the wing? So this becomes another debate, hey? And you, you, you talk about homegrown talent and we talk about, you know, bringing our kids through and we've seen them this year play in those positions and done really well and done a good job but then you've got to move someone around to accommodate for someone like Chance or Roger. So it, it's a tough position to be in. But for us, you and I, Willie, here, it's, it's, it's Roger at fullback. And mm. like we both said, there's nothing against Chance because I think he's a great fullback as well. But for the better, betterment of the Warriors moving forward, we think... You know, Roger should be the fullback. Yeah, and it's easy for me sitting here <laughs> yeah, correct. doing this. I've yeah. sat in, in Andrew Webster's seat before, and I know how hard it is. <laughs> I'm not having the conversations that he's having yeah. with the playing group yeah. and with the players individually. So I understand what he's going through. So, mm. you know, I'm taking nothing away from the job that he has and the enormity of managing that group and the players themselves. So, yeah, hey, I know I understand it's easy for me to sit here. <laughs> and yep. say as much as I want to say. That's my opinion, though. <laughs> Teamless out tonight. We'll see if it's still the same, if anything's changed or whatever. But the game that they're going to play this week coming, I think, is the final straw if they lose to Ooh. the Dolphins. Yeah. Because I think if they lose to the Dolphins, it's impossible to overtake the Dolphins, and the Dolphins are already out of the eight. So this is a big game for the Warriors that's coming up next week uh, so yeah we'll see what happens but speaking of the Dolphins we'll move on to the next game of last weekend Dolphins versus Roosters over in Perth um, 40 to 34 to the Roosters uh, it was a bit of a one of those everyone was swinging those punches around and stuff uh, 
But the Roosters got it done uh, for the only the second time or third time over a top eight, current top eight team at the time. Yeah. Every other game, uh, as I said on that stat a couple of weeks ago, uh, they were sucking against the good teams, but they've started putting it together perhaps. Yeah, um, and again, they get to take this game to Perth. Um, great opportunities. We're always, you know, the game is always growing. And I think over the last few years, Perth have had um, some great games of rugby league. They've had international games over there as well. So we have a lot of uh, league support. And I guess on the back of them putting their name in to try and get an NRL team over there, which would be enormous, but be massive travel for a lot of the players. But good luck to them. We don't play anymore. Um, a great game of rugby league. I think the difference for me, Sam Walker, well, he, without a doubt, he um, he will be in high demand on the market. I think he is testing the market too. And my um, intel, and I don't have any intel, that's just my thoughts, <laughs> is that I think the Broncos picked this kid up. Like, surely you've got to chuck the kitchen sink at him. I think everything that he does is class. Uh, he's a footballer. He's a goal kicker. Um, some of the tries that he scored, like an individual brilliance. And I think when it comes to game breakers in, in, in the competition, you wouldn't think someone of his small stature can turn a game on his head. And he does that you know, with class every single game. I think he puts his hand up and I think he's been enormous. Since, I guess, the dropping, the injuries, um, all those off-field things that are out of his control, that he's gone away and worked hard, and Trent Robinson gave him some opportunities to go back and grow his game, to get some confidence and get a feel for, you know, what he what he needs from him. And then coming back into the grade this year, I think he's been like a class with everything he does. So, you know, the game, exciting game. Uh, both, again, are both attacking teams. They're trying to play some football. But at the same time, I think, you know, like you said, it, the I think the Roosters subconsciously would be thinking these eight teams, and I think it always gets spoken about with them that they can't beat these teams. So uh, to get that one up on, on or get a win up against the Dolphins, who are fighting to, to be in the eight, who are fighting to find consistency with, you know, I think they lost Cody to a sickness during the week or early on he couldn't get over to Perth. So um, I think he's been a key player for Azai Katoa to play the way he, that he plays, to be able to do what he does. But now, a great game of rugby league. Um, Dom Young, hamstring, oh, that's a big loss, I think, for them. I think he's been enormous for them. Be good for our um, our, try score, our top try scorer in the competition, eh? Aloffi scoring tries for us. So thanks, not thank you to Dom Young, but I hope the vote gets right. But I'm just saying, you know what I mean? Like, we chucked it out there at the start. We'll put um, Aloffi in there for um, top try score. So, yeah, big, big game. Both teams are uh, playing for, you know, positions in either the eight or even to get in the four. And um, for me, Sam Walker was a difference. A massive difference. He's got the best short kicking game that I've seen since Alfie Langer. Hard. You know, just getting the ball out of nothing, just sees the space, puts it on his toe and then ends up scoring two tries. The second one was brilliant. It just grabbed it, boom, over the fullback and then went around him to score. Nobody sees that. You know, you've got to see that, assess the distance, assess what type of kick then gas it to beat the fullback to get to the ball, and he did it twice. Just outstanding. And um, we've waxed lyrical about the Roosters and their attack. And Satili Tupanua comes off, and mm. he scores a couple of tries for them. So dangerous with the ball. Um, they gave themselves a chance um, by kicking that penalty goal late on to be yeah. six behind the mm. Dolphins. Mm. But I don't think they were really ever going to threaten the Roosters to win it. They... They got close score-wise, but I just thought the momentum was always with the Roosters. And I think that's what frustrated and what's frustrating Wayne Bennett at the moment is their slide over the last month and a half to now be out of the eight is a cause for some big alarm. We just spoke about teams at the bottom and how you can upset the table. The Warriors have a chance to do that. They have a chance to upset the Dolphins and put them in some trouble whilst keeping themselves alive mm. this, year, this week and this year. So it's a big game for the Dolphins coming up this week on the back of them losing a couple here. But the Roosters, very, very good again with the ball. I feel like a broken record sometimes. But to win the league, to win this comp, you can't concede 34 points. You can't do it. They've, I know they're a top eight-ish team. Mm. They were technically mm. in the top eight at the time. But if they're going to threaten those top four teams, 
they can't be conceding 34 points against them. That's That's been their concern. And uh, there was a moment that highlighted for me when the Dolphins kicked it down and there was no one around the ball. Dom Young didn't get there, whether that was, was Hammy or you know, Tedesco didn't get there. They let it bounce and Bostock gets it back mm. for the Dolphins when the Roosters had every right and every responsibility to get to the ball first. But this is where the defence is at. They're not quite on it defensively in their mindset. I know you said, Adam, uh, that this game was good for our try scoring uh, predictions. <clears throat> I'll tell you what it wasn't good for is our point scoring point zero, predictions that, yes. because Jermaine Asako that, picked up an ankle injury. So they just, were um, they were kicking well. Both 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 boys were were they, were they both a hundred? I think they were both a uh, hundred. I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Um, which you know, along with tr- scoring tries for Jermaine, kicking goals is always good for us. Um, but yeah, he did pick up an ankle injury. I think that looked like it was just oh, actually the guy come around, swung, hit his leg. It was a bad one. And yeah, that one's that one happens a lot in the game. Is someone tackles legs, you swing around, you're standing there, and you try and jump over, and then you land on your ankle and twist it. Yeah, such twist a- it. <laughs> 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 and jump on it and twist it and then obviously it gets taken off on the sideline. So, yeah, disappointing for him. Hopefully it's nothing major. It's not a high, you know, syndesmosis or a, a high ankle sprain or grade. So um, hopefully he's back out there. And the other one I have kind of an issue oh, Actually, with. no, because the Warriors are playing him. So really just have a rest. <laughs> have a rest this weekend. Have rest this weekend. Yeah, yeah. Give, have a week games. off and then come back the next week. The other week. one I have a bone to pick with is uh, the Joey Manu tackle, as you yep. said before. So... Olam's one, right? The it was deemed grade three careless high tackle, three to four match ban. So he's contesting that ruling. The because, grading, he's contesting yeah, the, the grading. grading. He's pled guilty, but contesting the yep. grading because Joe Manu has pled guilty to his one. And guess what? It's only a thousand dollar fine, considering how similar ish they are. You'd think it'd be like maybe more of a fine than that. Like so, so Olam got a grade one, grade three. Careless. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's the Manu's is the exact same one, but only grade one. Yeah. I don't like, I think this is, a, this is most probably the gray area in the game as well as when you compare them. And I saw the Aussie, um, you know, Fox or whatever it is over in Australia put up the comparisons of the three different tackles. And if you look at them, they all look quite similar to me. You know what I mean? And all the fans would say the same thing. Well, why has he got three weeks here? He's only got to find there and he's got to find there. Like that's that's the problem, and we speak about this all year about these grey areas anyway, and the precedents that set. And I just said it early on a Thursday night, you know what I mean? Like they see that, and maybe they would have made a mistake and should have only just put that on report or you know ten minutes in the bin. It kind of sets it for the rest of the it sets the tone for the rest of the weekend. So um, yeah, I I think you got to try and challenge the grading, but even then, it, what, like, it's still going to be a careless high tackle. He just wants gets it down. He wants a grade one careless high tackle, does he? Which is only a fine. Yeah. But again, bro, you, like it's intent as well. You know what I mean? But we've said it. Every center's got intent to go out there and try and stop the play. You know what I mean? They've all come out of the line to whack. Joey Manu's come out to whack. So they've all yeah. come out of the line to whack. So there's there's intent in the tackle. And then like it's grade one careless. Like the bro got up and got up and played the ball. <laughs> you know, so I guess he may have some similar. Some the problem with those guys, um, Olam's most probably had some carryovers from similar incidents, which then get you to the grade three. So that's where it kind of stings you a little bit is that you got prior incidents, which then adds up into a grade three kind of, and how it kind of works in the judiciary system. I know I've been there plenty of times. <laughs> and that was mine for Justin Olam. His record, his previous yeah. record, will count against him, which I think there may be some. I'm going off the top of my head. Okay. It was really interesting with the Joey Manu one. The referee was, spoke to him and said there was force. Yeah, there's <laughs> force every time. It's a contact <laughs> sport. The, the centre's going to come flying yeah. in. As big as Joey Manu is, there's going to be some force. Yeah. And so you know, occasionally you're going to get it wrong, but as I said at the start, yeah. we've got to work on getting that target right. We've got to work on getting it down because the centres are going to find themselves in those situations every game. You know the one when if if we're trying to uh, avoid that contact with their head, and people are trying to target lower, um, unless you do a clean perfect hit, the old guys are really good now at turning their hips towards them, and then it's pretty much causing a hi a head a head collision 
or a head knock, you know what I mean? So it's a really like it's really hard these days to catch them front on because you've either got to come out in front, but these guys are coming from the side. So what they'll normally do is hit someone as they're not looking and then whack them that way. Eh? So if you're, if you're prepared to be whacked, you kind of move your hips to try and avoid getting smacked. And then from there, you get like a head knock and stuff like that. So yeah, it's it's timing, it's, posi it's precision, it's trying to do things legally so that you don't put yourself in those positions to make high contact. So yeah, tough one anyway, tough one. But these are all the gray areas, my bro. On to the next game, Titans versus Broncos at Seabus Super Stadium. 46-18 to the Titans. Whoa, what a domination. And if we thought that the Warriors were down bad in terms yeah. of how hard it is for them to get back, I'm, like, I'm pretty sure it's impossible that the Broncos are going to make it into the finals at this point. They've lost, what is it, seven in a row, I think. And this one, the manner in which they lost it. I know they lost, obviously, Payne Haas. But Ezra, man. what was it, 20 points in like the last 15 minutes conceded? Something and like that. some of those tries were Whoa. real soft, bro, like real soft, like going jumping up and no one getting the ball and they're just landing in someone's hand or, you know, uh, Keanu Kenny getting into the space and picking up a bounce of a ball and then diving over on the try line where you would think that they'll have the numbers around the ball if you were competing to play and to win, you find yourself in those positions. But it's the difference between the good teams and the bad teams at the moment and the, and the confidence that these good teams have is that everyone's playing for or the teams that want to play in finals football, playing for their for their season. Uh, they're turning up and trying to play football. And I think the Titans have had their measure the last couple of years, I reckon, and, and put some score lines on the Broncos this year already, done them earlier, so it's two times now. I definitely think it's the big brother, small brother thing down there. It's we want to beat the Broncos because of who they are. The same thing with the Cowboys is the Broncos are on a pedestal in Queensland and they are the best team um, they are, you know, run by, I think it's one of the media companies who look after them. They get Thursday, Friday night games. Everyone's jealous. They've got 35,000 members plus. They turn up, you play on Suncorp Stadium. You don't even have to travel out of Australia because, or out of um, Queensland because most of their games are played up there in Queensland. <laughs> I think they have the best draw out of anyone. So for, for a team like the Titans, they go, hey, let's go up there and, and well, let's bring them on our turf and beat them, even more so if you beat them at Suncorp. But they they played, like, they're a good team, the Titans. I think we've spoken about them this year. They are attacking football, and when they get it right, that's what they can do. Keanu, Kenny, Fafida, obviously playing against his old mates, really good mates with a lot of those guys there. He was enormous for them. I think Keanu, Kenny has gone to another level. He's really toughened up as a small, small fullback. You cannot leave him on the bench. He is their fullback. I think, you know, some of the tries they scored, just competing, and but again, the Broncos were just soft. I don't know. You go from, you know, what what I do know when you play in grand finals, or if you play in, in a grand final at all, the next year is only going to be harder. Uh, and what you've done that year to get to the grand final doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get back there again. Um, very lucky in my time at the Melbourne Storm, we got there most years, which I was I was grateful and blessed for. But then left to another club where never even saw semi final football or finals football or top top eight football. So whether subconsciously, and I know that they wouldn't be thinking this out and out loud, but I think maybe subconsciously they've they've found a little bit of complacency in 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 their game or in themselves where we've got the same team as last year minus a couple of players that we can turn up every game and win. I don't know if that's in their mindset, but I think subconsciously that would have been in their mind uh, that we're good enough to win. They play a style of football where I think is exciting because they've got all these young kids. You lose someone like Adam Reynolds for half the season where he's been your leader. You lose Ezra Mann in the game, Payne Haas, who, are his, who is enormous and is their leader through the middle of the park on the back of that and their inconsistency around their performance this year, you get what we saw on uh, against the, the Gold Coast Titans, which was a disappointing result for the context of the club. And, and this is the pressure that they have as a club. And you hear Kevy Walters always say after, that, like, this is not the Broncos. We are a team that always play finals football, but we're just not getting it right right now. And what that is, he actually doesn't even know himself. He's trying to find the answers uh, through their team. But what I think, what I think is, it's just, it's just purely just hard work. Just 
get back to the real basics of the rugby league game and work hard as a team to get yourself better prepared so that you can turn up and, and be tough for each other. You're not going to have all your superstars on the field through the whole year. That's a given. But what you do have is a great group of kids that can play some footballs, but they're just not putting it on at the moment. I'll go back to the Canterbury game. The, the dog that the, the Broncos played at home and I spoke about it then. You could see that they were off defensively in their attitude and their application. And there was some of that this weekend for me, but there was some of it about their systems and not adjusting mm. on the run. There was a couple of last play incidents. There was a last play in the first half and teams are insistent on sending three back, two wingers and the full back getting ready for the kick, which is fine when it's in the middle of the field because you can start to make some adjustments as a winger. But when it's on a short side, the winger's got to tuck up a little bit. Mm. So what happened with the with the Titans, especially someone smart like Kieran Foran, he spotted that. And I think because it was so early in the game, he spotted it during the week. He's parked himself down the short side, put Keanu Kinney down the short side, which made it a five. So essentially with the winger gone, and it was Corey Oates on this occasion, he's gone back. It's five on three. It's five on three. They skip out the back. Keanu Kinney's now got a three on one. Mm. He jumps sideways and he's just, the fullback, the wing is still not coming up. So the three on one pass it back, come back to Keanu Kinney. He scores the opening try. That incident happens later on in the game where it's another short side, but only one comes up. I think it's Pierre Crura that comes up mm. for the Broncos. Um, Kieran Fawn shapes the kick. Dummies runs. They take him again. So they're not learning on the run. They're not learning on the run about it and the effort levels just weren't there. They weren't good enough. Fantastic were the Titans. Keanu Kinney was outstanding for me on this occasion. And as Blair said, that's a double. That's a double then for them now against the Broncos, against a much fancy club, a, a bigger spender and as far as their cap is concerned. New coach come in. Des Hazler's done a great job. And uh, we spoke about the Warriors and their home crowd. Well done, the Gold Coast. They mm. sold it out. And rightly so, they could sell out this weekend too on the back of that. But you know, the Broncos' concerns for me are around their effort levels. Another area, and we'll speak about it some more, teams are insisting, and I'm, I'm not sure why, when there's a scrum in the middle of the field mm. and they split four on two on splitting defensively four on two. With the, with the pace that players have today, I saw it three occasions and three times the defensive team got done. There was one on this occasion where you got this, the pace of Keanu Kinney who's just got to skip outside yeah. his, his defender and get the winger interested. Once he's got him in, pass, go. And if not, he's quick enough to burn him and go around the outside. Jai Gray um, did that yeah. for South Sydney. Mm. And there was another one, uh, Bronson Cherry did it for the dogs where he skips on the outside and passes it to Ado Carr. But... Teams can't do that. You can't do that with the pace of player. You're better off going three with three on three. three and split your back rows to go mm. hard. Four on two is too dangerous nowadays. Yeah, I, I understand why. Yeah, you've, you've got to you've got to put three on three. Or three. If, even if there's a four over there, you still put three. You put your three on your two because we've seen um, our little mate at the storm. What's his name? The, the so, yeah, so, so did it really there. Like you put two on two on him. Right. Good luck. He scored every time. Every every day of the week, every time, every day of the week. So I think the the perfect perfect thing would be three on three, um, and then trying to go the and the if you got the four, put the half on that side. So you're pushing. So then you end up with four defenders. Eh? So that's how you do. It. Or your back row is just breaking. We have to work hard. But never, I would never put a two on two because I'm always going to go to the two if I'm an attacker and just give a one on one. And the the guys these days, Keanu, Kenny, Saw, you know, Bronze and Cherry, those guys. They've, the guys with speed are going to threaten you every time and put you under pressure. So, um, And then if you look at the, the Titans' outside backs, they are guys that just play footy. They can get on the outside. They're hard to handle. Karen Fawn, like you said, down those short side, they've got enough play of football in them to take on those short sides and not afraid to. But then if they do get half tackled, they're going to kick the ball anyway. So like they, they picked up something, like you said, Willie, and thought, saw those opportunities. And they've got players in that centre position, the Brian Kelly's, that can play football. And you get them the ball, they will, and Philip Sami, that they, they, they literally take on short side like no other team does. Sami's been great in yeah. the centres for me. Mm -hmm. He's been outstanding. Hard since to he's handle. Gone. 
Big quick. body. Yeah. Big and got some great hands. Yep. I didn't, didn't realise he had those in playing on the wing, but our man Alufi scored again. Mm -hmm. Alufi got what's, over. What's, what's he sitting at? 20 for the season? 20 on the season, 40 in his career in 39 games. What's what's the top try scorer at the minute? Him. <laughs> 20, I think he's beating he's got plenty Dean to go. Mariner by three now. He might play finals football. Come on, Titans, get up there. <laughs> no, no, because then the Warriors, nah. <laughs> oh, up, let's, let's go. Go a lot. Go a lot. Get some more tries. Uh, one guy that I do want to highlight because he's always, as long as he's at the Titans at the moment, he's always going to be the second fiddle because of his namesake. Jojo Fafita in Yo. this game filled yep. up the stat sheet. A lot in part what uh, you were saying with the short side play, him and Kinney. Three tries, three line breaks, three try assists. Like the man was cooking on the wing. Uh, He's quick. He, yeah. I haven't seen him actually get right into space, but I had him in the Maldives camp. And now our GPS men, who are just massive on GPSs and stats, you know those fellas, my stat men. <laughs> they're like, that's the fastest, like, I don't know what, like meters per second he's seen in a long time, like just over like, at trainings, and I'm thinking, I haven't seen him actually get into space and open right up yet. You know, you see a Loffy and how yeah. you, how yeah. he how dangerous he is, uh, Jason Saab, but they think that he, he reckons like he is his top speed is right up there with the best. So, um, yeah, like I, when you've got fast wingers like that, you give them any space, feed the ball to them, let them go. You know, and, and nine times out of ten, they're going to get on the outside of someone. But he's He's like big boy he's too. a big boy for feeder, like strong, solid carry of the ball, like and quick at the same time. Like yeah, he played well. Like they're coming into their own the Gold Coast Titans. I think they got a good team that can compete with the best if they put put it all together. And I take it you guys would say they keep Campbell Kinney as the six one for the rest of the season, guaranteed. Even if Brimo is all goods to come. Brimo. Back. Yeah, 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 you're the very yeah. yeah. <laughs> nickname basis. <laughs> right? I think Keanu Kinney is their fullback, and yeah. he has to be rewarded for his efforts. And yeah, Brimson somewhere on the bench can come on as your 14 man. Um, yeah. I think they're doing a good job of what they have. Yeah, Campbell's a great six too. He's 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 athletic. He can play some foot. He's got a great kick on him. Tough. They can defend well. So I think they keep it as it is and find Brimo, as you would say, <laughs> a spot on the bench 14. <laughs> Shout out Brimo, I'll see you uh, in the weekend, bro. Um, Billy, me, Billy Pavilion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on to the next game, Storm versus Dragons at Amy Park. Historic win, well not bro. historic, but long time coming win, 18-16 to the Dragons. And how about this? So 25-year drought uh, in Melbourne since the Dragons last beat them there. Not since 1999. Uh, the, the length of time so long that... Tyron Wishart's dad was, was playing for the Dragons in wow. that win. So how about that? Uh, too bad that his son was the one on the receiving end of this game, but the Dragons got it done. Yeah, um, massive surprise for me. Uh, massive surprise. Uh, if you thought the, the Eels upset against the Warriors <laughs> with the stats showing and the, the TAB, TAB had them in twenty to beat the Eels, these guys would have been less than that, a dollar to beat the Dragons, but the Dragons turned up to play. Um, but like, again, we speak, we've speak. we spoken about the Dragons a lot on here with the inconsistency and then playing really well and then losing and then coming back again. Like, I think I got to half time and it was a close game. And then I thought, ah, you know, the, the Storm will kick on and beat them. And then I come back and I was like, hey, they're back in the game here. Uh, the Dragons are playing, playing some tough footy. Ben Hunt for me, competitor, I think, you know, his, his, I guess his knowledge, but his calmness. Like I don't think too much rattles Ben Hunt, but you know you're coming up against your your fellow Queensland mates, um, and I guess you got Jaden Sewer in there as well, who's who I thought was enormous for them. You know, big body, strong carry of the ball, challenging the line every time. But Ben Hunt, I think, would see the top try assist in the competition mm -hmm. um, between their kicks and his passing and his ability to find space for his players. I thought that was a, um, a huge historic win. For, for the Dragons, and uh, the Melbourne Storm will be disappointed, I think. Um, they were taking, and I think I heard uh, Craig Bellamy say after the game, is that they would, they did things individually and not as a team. Uh, they took on, they must really saw too much space and, and played a little bit selfish, I thought, at times. And I think, you know, when you, when you think of a Melbourne Storm, they are a one team connected. They don't rely on one player to make a difference. They rely on 
the 17 on the field to, to, to win the performance. And I think there was moments in the game where uh, you look back, they would look back and I think, you know, they should have just passed the ball or should have just taken the easy option, whether they just, like they wouldn't always do, get down, play the ball quick and play off the back of that. Jerome Hughes still, for me, was was working his butt off. You know, he, he is enormous for, for, the, for the Melbourne Storm. But, you know, a disappointing loss back to the drawing board for the Storm. Luckily, where they are, they're OK. Craig Bellamy will be so disappointed. I think they'll be doing a lot of um, defensive work. <laughs> Although they do a lot of defensive work anyway, but even when they win, they still do more defensive work. <laughs> so that's why what makes them, you know, different to the rest. But they'll be uh, filthy on that. Uh, individuals will be filthy. I saw Harry Grant wasn't happy with his performance, um, being the class player that he is and what he's been able to do in the game so far. Origin player as well. So back to the drawing board for those guys. But a huge win for the St George Illa Warra Dragons in the context of where the ladder sits because, you know, Warriors, if the Warriors were to win, Dragons were to lose, uh, Dolphins lose the Roosters, they sneak up the ladder. Didn't happen like that. The Dragons took it away from everyone. Yeah, whether the, the Storm were complacent that Munster was back. They played a good stint last week, but he started this week for the first time in a long time. And they had him and uh, Jerome Hughes and Pappenhausen starting the game with, um, with Hunt. Um, with Grant, sorry, Harry Grant starting there, um, that spine hasn't been together yeah. enough and they're still finding their feet. And, but having them together, whether that caused them to have a bit of complacency and, you know, with those four, we'll get it done, especially the way that Jerome Hughes has been playing and did play well, mm. did play well, split him open a couple of times. But I thought Jaden Sewer was superb for the Dragons, had a hand in all three tries. Yeah set up the offload and it was great to see Tyrell Sloan back back in after getting dropped the week before, took his lessons and then showed what quality and class he's got. That try when he faked a kick and burnt Pappenhausen and burnt him quite easily. And I did a really good job there. But Jaden Sewell took his try as well. But look at the score, 18-16, we're, all, we're talking about it quite a bit. Um, here today, defensively is where the key is. You keep teams to 18 mm. or less, you should be able to go on and win. And they kept the Storm to 16. And what have they got? They've got the two points and, and a record class win for them down in Melbourne. I gave them no chance. Yeah. I gave them no chance. And it, it spoiled my tips for the weekend. But good on the Dragons, good on Shane Flanagan. They've, what they've got to get now is that consistency to be able to replicate that sort of form every single week. But what that takes is effort. You've got to be able to turn up and give that type of effort into the game and that willingness to defend with that effort every single week. That's a challenge that some teams can't do. For um, <clears throat> Ben Hunt, uh, he this is his, actually his career high year for tri -assists. So previously 21 tri in 2015, now 24 on the season with four games left guaranteed and they're in the eight. Uh, is he uh, Flanagan's coaching unlocking him perhaps? It's crazy because before Flanagan turned up, he was on the outer. Like he wanted to leave that place, and then sitting down, obviously had to sit down with Flanagan, and Flanagan changed his mind, and um, he's gone out there and created, I think, you know, his his best season since 2015. Although I think he's been consistent since he's been at the Dragons. Uh, the Dragons haven't been consistent, but his performance has been. Um, yeah, something that he's unlocked. Obviously, he's now the, the captain down there. He's been the captain for a while now and his leadership. But I think his, I guess as you get older, similar to Cherry Evans, they, they, they understand the game really well. They understand what their strengths are and where they need to get teams on the position to create opportunities for himself. But also understand that he can create opportunities for others and hence why he's, his try assist is where it is. It's career best for him. And yeah, Lanigan's managed to open up something and Ben that he trusts and believes in and got some players around him. And I think Jaden Sewell has been a big part of, you know, that, that team on that edge for him as well and helping him be, I guess, that strong defender, um, but also attacking weapon for, for him. And then obviously having Lomax, who's a, who's a jumper with his kicking ability. Sloan, who's now back in there with his being able to put grubbers in behind the line. I think that's all unlocked some of the work for Ben Hunt this year. Here's a couple of things for me. Uh, they spoke about it at the start of the game and they showed the stats. Our pick for Deli M, uh, the late runner, Jerome Hughes, has mm. been going fantastically well and was good again. But there's almost a competition going on between him and Ben Hunt and those 
the big standout stat was those try assists that he keeps racking up every single week. Now, Jerome Hughes has got some other stats where he's leading. He doesn't make nearly as many errors, and that's reflective of how the Storm play. Mm. So um, it's great to see Ben Hunt finding some form again, being happy, uh, as opposed to what he was 12 months ago. Um, the conversations that he had with Shane Flanagan to convince him to stay and that it was going to be the best move for him have obviously come to fruition. Now my next question is, do you think there's ever been any questions in his head that Zach Lomax regrets wanting to get out so soon? Yeah. Well, there was that news of uh, when he signed that Eels contract like a couple weeks after... That was when the Eels' slide began. So they won a few games early in the yeah. season and then they just went on that four-game losing streak and then it came out that he was asking to re rewrite into the contract a clause. So I think possibly over the course of the season, it is highly likely that he's thought of that. Without a doubt, bro. With, without a doubt, when you... I think this is uh, this is the beauty of our game, isn't it? Um, you know, you, you have a vision of playing in the, playing somewhere or in a position that you think you're you're most suited to at, at a at a club where you're not getting that opportunity. Um, so you're making the most of it at the club that you're at now. You end up going on to playing Origin because you've you've put your body on the line in that position because you wanted to impress and do the best you can and not drop your lip. You get an opportunity to at another club where you think is the op the right opportunity. Whether you're going over there for be a centre, you watch their form and you falls away, and then you start thinking, "Geez, did I make the right decision?" Again, I still think there's a possibility in the game of rugby league that the bro may not leave. <laughs> I, you know, what I mean, which which is bad because you write a you sign a contract for whatever for whatever reason, and you should be honouring the contract. But in today's day and age, the contracts don't mean anything anymore and anyone can leave. And it doesn't matter whether you're the player wanting to do it, the club does the same thing as well. So they will say, as, as a fan, if you're a fan of the Dragons, if you're a fan of the Parramatta Eels, you would be disappointed if he was to say no to Parramatta Eels now and come back to the Dragons. They'll be celebrating. But the way the game goes, anything can happen these days. And I get it. But at the same time, you are loyal to yourself. You are loyal to yourself and you only have a short period in this game to maximise whatever opportunity you think you have. So whether you think that it's going to be best to go to Parramatta or stay where you are, it all depends on, you know, Lomax and what he thinks is the best for him. But there'll be some filthy people if he backflips on this deal, that's for sure. And it'll be big news. <laughs> we'll break some mean stories. Uh, on to the next game, Sharks versus Rabbitohs at Points Bet Stadium, 20-6 to six to the Sharks. They've kind of stabilised a bit. They're keeping themselves in the top four, even though you know they've got the Bulldogs, the Cowboys hot on their tails. But for now, they're doing all right. But injury to Braden Trindle yeah. after already no Hines still for maybe the rest of the season could be spelling some bad news for them. Yeah, well, you got to look for um, replacement, and I think you know they've been in and out of replacing their halves this year and trying to find some consistency. Started off with Trindle and Hines. I think they played well through the the um, Indigenous game, and they led into their season. Started really well against the Warriors. Come back, won that game. Uh, won some really tough games, then fell off the cliff again. What we said last week, I think they. They've done enough in the early rounds to get them into the position there and now what they need to do is just hold on, hold on now and, and hope that they can get as like you know get someone in there that can get a job done. I think same with same with the Rabbitohs. I thought um, you know for the season that they've had to be able to be competing and trying to play for an eighth position or play in the finals is a massive effort for what they've been able to go through this year with the injuries and everything that they've done. Um, but Cronulla would be happy. To, to take this win. Um, you know, you're coming up against a team that's I think is, you know, building some consistency or playing well in moments, but in periods not. Um, and then you've got some good guys like Drago, who's I think is is a bright star on the rise, given opportunities where you play him. If LaChelle comes back in, I don't know, but this kid's got some talent. Um, he's, you know, we talk about those scrum plays. 
you know, anyone with speed on there is always going to be challenging a defender. So um, and a, a disappointing performance from the Rabbitohs, which they will be disappointed in, but a great win from the Sharks in comparison to what they've got, you know, with their players now, Trindle being on the sideline. They're going to have to find, I, I actually don't know, oh, Atkins. Atkins Atkinson. Atkinson. He, he may fit into that position who's filled there before when they played against the Storm and won that game. But I think leadership around the halves and spine is the most important thing. So if you're losing someone like Trindle and Nico Hines, who's saying he's out for the season, you're going to have to rely on someone, you know, someone like Atkinson or, and, and, and Co to try and get them into the finals and hold that spot there. So, yeah, it, it's what have we got? Four games, five games left, uh, four games to go. And... The, the comp's only heating up because the games are bigger and better, and um, that's why we're seeing the score lines that we're doing. Um, you know, so yeah, another another win for the Sharks keeps them in that position where they are. Yeah, timing's such a big important thing over the course of the season in the NRL, and your time you run, your time when you mm. pick up your wins, and, and Blairy said it earlier in, in the year. Fortunately, the the Sharks picked up a few wins and banked a, a couple of. Of those wins early and they've gone through a bit of a slump and they're coming out of it now. They've just got to hold on, as Blair is saying, to keep collecting those wins because the timing, every team's going to get injuries throughout the course of the year. It comes back to that timing, the timing of those injuries. Unfortunately for the Sharks, getting them at the back end of the season mm. doesn't help you because at this moment in time, a four or five week injury, which doesn't hurt you too much at the start of the year, could be the season right now. Mm -hmm. It could be your season done. And the Sharks, they need all hands on deck. They've got no Trindle now. They've got no Hines. Um, Mulitalo didn't play on the weekend. Mm -hmm. He's another one. They need all hands on deck if they're, one, to solidify their, their spot in the top four, but to also get a win and try and go as deep as they can or as deep as they want to and can do with their top squad in the top eight. Well, the top four is the most important, you know what I mean? It is the most impo important position on the ladder. And they're sitting, what, on 30 points in fourth position right now with the dogs nipping at their heels on 28. Yeah. So, you know, again, they've got to just hold on for dear life over this next four weeks and win, you know, two out of those four games to try and lock themselves into that fourth position. And hopefully the Bulldogs fall over somewhere in there as well, <laughs> which... I see the Bulldogs kicking on, and I see the the, the Sharks most probably getting two wins out of the next four. But well, and the Cowboys oh, and have a bye to come, and they're on twenty eight points. Well, as there well. you go, and the Cowboys. So, man, everyone's fighting for that fourth position, or that third and fourth position at the minute. So, you know that everyone needs to hang on, and uh, hopefully, because when you get to that four, you get that second chance. That's what everyone's looking for: second chance to to play and give yourself an opportunity to play in the final. So, hang on, Sharkies. Down the other end of the ladder at third from the bottom is the Rabbitohs. Season over in terms of getting to the finals. Yeah. Should they bring back Latrell or not? Now that we've seen that they've lost two of their nah. three games. No, nah. bring him back? No, nah. get him ready for next year. There's no point bringing someone of his calibre back into the team if you're not going to be playing finals football. You know, bring in, you know, Jai Gray's doing a great job there. Get him some more exposure, get him some game time, get him some consistency on the field, some confidence. Um, Keep Latrell on the sidelines, put him on ice, make sure he's ready for preseason, ready to go. Yeah, I'm just imagining Wayne Bennett ringing them up now. <laughs> Leave him alone. Yeah. Don't you dare pick him. They've got to, they've just got to put him on ice and get him fit and ready to go for next year. What it also does is it gives Jai Gray mm. some important time, it gives him as much playing time and more experience to finish off the season as as strongly as he possibly can. He's grown. He's he's gone from strength to strength. You might even challenge Latrell and give Wayne Bennett some food for thought. Yes, yeah, sweet as. Uh, we'll move on to the final day of games, uh, the first one of those on the Sunday. Panthers versus the Knights uh, <laughs> at Blue Bet. 22-14 to 14 to the Panthers. Of course they were going to win. They're the best team ever, like pretty much. So do I need to say anything? Just tell me how good the Panthers are. Is your favourite player Nathan Cleary? Of course, man. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when I went to school with them and all that oh, stuff? Oh, my bro. <laughs> what, what, is, what school was he again? Sacred. Sa Art, sacred, man. sacred. Good old sacred, eh? Yeah. Um, bro, again, when you, when you speak about timing, Willie, and, um, you know, when he gets injured, I feel like it happened last year as well for the Penrith Panthers. 
He gets injured. He has about what, seven to eight weeks off during the middle of the season. They manage to keep themselves in, in top positions. And then when he comes back, he's only come back bigger and better for the Penrith Panthers. And I think, you know, when you, you just go over their last few years of timings and when he's been able to come back from injury and what he's been able to do when he's come back, obviously wins the game with a drop kick, comes back, plays this game. I thought he was enormous. And for, for a guy, and everyone's obviously putting him right up there and being the best half in a long time. I think he's got star quality written all over him. And, you know, he's going, what is it, five, four grand finals? Going into five grand, this was this me there? Five fifth cons- grand final. Fifth consecutive grand final, going for four grand final wins. That's unbelievable. Like, you know, for... Like I, we spoke. I spoke about the Broncos earlier and how complacency I feel from the outside looking in has kind of fallen into some of their players subconsciously. Um, when you talk about the Penrith Panthers, there is you don't see anything like that through their team, and I think it's led by this guy and a lot of these other senior players, Moses Leota, um, Fisher Harris. Uh, some of the outside backs, um, you know, Toto. I think Jerome's been awesome for them this year when the times have been tough. But they were never in doubt against a, a Knights team that has, like some of those teams below the, the eight, have been inconsistent. And I think it's been the defensive stuff for us. And it's measurably the, been the biggest separation from a lot of those top eight teams is defence. And um, alongside having someone like Nathan Clear's calibre out on the field that actually guides and leads them around the field, like they are... You know, Liam, alongside Liam Martin as well, they are a tough team to beat and they'll be competing again, I think. Uh, did we say that it's going to be Storm, Storm Panthers, yeah, Panthers finals? You know week. what I mean? I think, like, I still feel like those two teams are the two best teams, although the Storm had a little blimp against the Dragons. I still think those two teams are going to be there at grand final day competing and, you know, alongside Nathan Cleary leading the charge. Aw- awesome performance. Yeah, well, I picked the Broncos early in the season. I don't think they're going to be. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I had them in my top four, but they're gone. So did I had the Warriors say so they're gone. But I did have the Storm and uh, Panthers. Where the Panthers are at now and watching them on the weekend, this has been a couple of seasons in the making. You know, we look at their success and we look at it at the present. But we look at that team, um, the young fullback, Iongi that they had yes. didn't have the best start to the game. They went for a 40-20 and he knocks the ball on. But everything else he did was fantastic. You know, in the absence of Dane Laurie and uh, Dylan Edwards, they call up another young fella and um, Jesse McLean yep. in the centres, outstanding. These these guys have come through a system that they've built to be ready for now. In the absence of Kikau, Crichton, um, Kurosawa, big names that they've lost, because of the salary cap and the reliance on their production line is starting to pay dividends now. And that's why they're still the team that's going to be challenging, you know, f- challenging for their fifth grand final in a row. Those young fellas were outstanding. You know, Cleary, Luai at the moment, they know how to get it done. They know how to lead the team where they've got to be. Isaiah Yo in the middle of the field, mm. just directing. I've had a theory for them for a while that they start building for the grand final run about this time of year mm. or a little bit before. They, they played a little bit differently this week with a lot of shifts, a lot of plays off Yo and Yardage. They did a couple when um, the one was, one of them was nearly inside their 10 metre line mm. where they shifted out to Isaac Tungwa and he makes a break. They're seeing that sort of stuff and I can just see them building nicely and putting the pieces together for how they want to attack it in the eight. And I'm excited if they're going to play like that. I'm excited that they're going to ask those sort of questions, but they are just so in sync. The Knights, to their credit, they they tried hard. They tried hard, but again, go back to what we said a couple of weeks ago, their issues are their their halves combination, and they can't settle on one. They had another one. They had to put a hooker into the halves this week. Crossland. Crossland and uh, Tyson Gamble. But unless they get consistent with that, they won't get consistent on the field and their performances, I think. And yeah. they don't get consistency out of Ponga either. I just don't know, like, if there's any halves that are going to change them right now that they have in their in their in their system. Um, got some good outside backs coming through. Some of that, you know, Fletcher Sharp. I think he's a great player, um, but I don't see them changing too much. Like, if you have to use Phoenix Crossland as a half, then 
who is normally their hooker and was big for them last year in the hooker position, then you're struggling to find. But uh, along with obviously struggling in those half, in that spines position, this halves, I guess it's still the off, off, you know, the noise in the background about people having to be shifted on off salary cap. I think that doesn't help their situation as well, and which would be frustrating for Adam O'Brien when you, you think you've got a, a capable team to get a job done, and then but there's a lot of noise around everything that's going on. If you look at their combinations through the year, they've had different spines all year, and they've tried everything, or different halves. I mean, sorry, and they've tried everything, and nothing's really worked for them yet. So, um, you know. I don't know what they what they're gonna do to try and change it over the next four weeks to try and compete and try and get in a better position that they are. So tough one. I think they've got to find a combination and stick with it. And stick with it. And you're gonna have some bad moments. Mm. You're gonna have some tough outings. But like a player's individual career, you gotta ride out those tough moments and go through it sometimes in order to be better. And I think that's and again, my opinion, they've got to find a combination and stick with it for a little while. Well, enough about the Knights. Just back on the Panthers because up the Panthers. Um, do you guys think that Samoan they will, markets? That they will, <laughs> guys, it's real. Yes. I'm a day one. I'm part of the members club. I fly over for every game. Um, do you think that the Panthers care about the minor premiership? They're two points back from the Storm in first. Do you think they're going to go hundy and try and overtake the storm just to like spit in the face for losing the first game of uh, the season to them or something like that? Um, honestly, the, I don't think the minor premiership means too much in, in the context of where your season wants to finish up. Um, it's a great little accolade and it shows that you're the most consistent team over the 27 weeks. But does being the top, you know, being one win you the grand final? It has, well, the Panthers have proven that over the time. But I think it's, it's a nice reward to show the individuals, the club and the team that we are the most consistent throughout the 27 weeks of this competition, which is a tough competition. Um, so I don't know if they're thinking about, let's, like, obviously you want to keep winning, so will the Storm, you know what I mean? So I don't think it's in their minds that we'll try and get one up over the Storm and try and win this. If it comes to them, awesome, because, you know, they deserve it, or whoever comes first deserves deserves that that uh, minor premiership. But at the end of the day, the bigger reward is winning the grand final. So, although it shifts, you know, you get through this next four weeks, the shift really turns into premiership, winning the comp. In the grand final, you're going to wear your uh, Storm jersey when we watch it, and I'll wear this, and we can. Have I could wear both. On. I'll get one and cut them half. I've got a half. I've got a Penrith one there, my bro. Hey, where'd you get your Penrith one from? Oh, from the man himself, my bro. <laughs> Who's that? You don't know the man. The man. Fish. Oh, of course. Uh, yeah, I'm friends with them too. You're yeah, friends with He's your cousin, eh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> from Sacred up north. Sacred from up north. Nah, from yeah, up north. Oh, from, yeah, Whangare pra- Boys. Primary school I went. Whangare yeah. Boys. <laughs> uh, and on to the last game of the round, Bulldogs versus the Raiders at Belmore Sports Ground, 22-18 to the Bulldogs. Maybe the game of the round. What a Cracker. electrifying uh, second half, especially man. That was awesome game, and it was all Stephen Crichton, eh? Uh, that in the end, yeah, well, captain of the year. Cracker, crack of crack of a game. I thought very much probably the best football I've watched over the weekend. Um, you know, two teams going at it uh, and defensively turning up for each other. Attack wise, was moments. It was just a couple of individual moments from. Stephen Crichton, uh, his, but again, like he he makes and creates his own luck. You know what I mean? That that little chip through runs around the the flag and then comes in and scores a try. Like those things, like I reckon he practices that stuff at training. You know what I mean? You don't just pull that off in the game. Um, but he is, yeah, like you said, I think he is most probably the captain of the year for us, along with most probably going close to getting that coach as well. I know we said Wayne Bennett, but. When you look at the the season that they've had in the 18 months that they've had, I think he's been enormous, the coach, uh, and what he's been able to create with all those players from Kikau to Burden to Crichton and what his leadership has shown through that through these through these games and in these big moments and big moments and big games, you look for your big game players and he's one that they go to and is their strike. It, it goes that far to find himself through the middle of the park when Burden's putting up kicks, putting up bombs. And if you're a right-hand centre and you're kicking on the left-hand side and you find yourself over there, it shows you how much it means to, 
to Crichton, the captain, to go and put himself in the position to compete. I think he went up, got it, tapped it back down, they scored a try. He's the right centre doing it on the left-hand side. So he's doing everything possible for his team this year to get them into the spot where they are to try and play finals football. They'll go close to knocking on their fourth position if they continue to keep doing what they're doing. But what a game, I guess, Joseph, um, Josh Papali's um, 300th game. Is he, the, is he many other, besides Rubes? Samoan players in the NRL that have, have no, got the 300. Think so. I think, what is he, 52? I think player 52 to play 300 games <laughs> in the, in the um, you know, in the <laughs> game of... 52 years old. In the game of rugby league. So, um, you know, a f- second Samoan player to do it. I think it's a great accolade for everything that he's done, not only um, at... at at um, the, the Raiders, uh, but also through through Queensland, Samoa, Australia, uh, everything that he's done, I think it's um, you know disappointing that they couldn't get the they d- couldn't get the win. But I thought you know they were so close um, to getting that one, but just not good enough in the end. And credit to the Bulldogs, they turned up and went after. So it was awesome. It was an awesome game. Like you know you couldn't split them. I reckon you couldn't split them, and it was going to take an individual brilliance or a moment. For them to break it up and, and win their game, and you know the dogs got them in the end. Yeah, just a shame for Josh, partly that they couldn't get the win. You'd always like to see players celebrate those incredible milestones with the victory, and the Raiders definitely went after it to do that for their leader and uh, celebrate the day in the right way. We saw that when the Roosters did it. Roosters did it with uh, for Jared, worried at White our Hargraves. So, yeah, unfortunate. Fairy tales don't always come out, mm. but they gave it their best shot, the Raiders. They stayed in the fight and it was spoken glowingly and, and rightly so about Stephen Crichton and his effort. But I really liked his first try as well. Mm. The power he showed, one, to take on Sebastian Chris and then fend him off and then just bump um, Jordan Rappiner to get the ball down in the corner and to do it in front of the Dogs faithful at Belmore. A sold-out Belmore. You know, it's one of those... You got to experience it. Yeah. You got to be there. Never it's played, almost never been there. It's it? almost like a a football environment mm. in England. You know, with the, the crowd, they love it. They they bay blood out of out of the opposition, and they're right on top of you. And the hills full. So um, it was good to see it full again. It was good to see the traditional ground where the doggies have had so much success in the past, with the likes of Terry Lamb and Paul Langback and. Mm. Um, Steve Mortimer go out and do it all again. It reminded me of some of those days. But the dogs, they're on a fantastic run. Yeah, Cameron Serrata has done a great job. and uh, Hopefully uh, he'd go close to getting coach of the year. And to get coach of the year and captain of the year and, and go deep into the playoffs, uh, that's a success already. I, I think they've their, their season's a success now, but it'll be even more so if that can happen. For our picks, yes, we, we did. did pick Wayne Bennett. Serrato, though. But right? me and Willie, Went we brought Cerrado. up Serrato. We did say him, but you... Yeah, you, I, saw, I saw your eyes. I there. saw your eyes. <laughs> but we downloaded, we dropped in Serrato, yeah, didn't we? We name dropped him. He was he was definitely second choice. And if we were to remake it, I'm sure he'd be the first choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true, true. <laughs> no offence, Wayne, but... They're, but they've, they've been awesome. Like, like you said, Willie, I think he's done a great job. 18 months, very lucky to have um, Phil Gould in his... Yep. In his and his uh, seat too, because I think through those tough times, similar to like someone like, you know, Benji would love to have someone like Gus Gould next to him, to be able to build it and have trust in the processes of where they're heading and developing their players. I think Benji would love to have someone like Gus next to him to, to keep him, you know, keep him, or we'll hold his hand and guide him through that process. 18 months it's taken Serrato to build his culture and build the players yep. up to where he's wanted to do. You don't really get that much time in the game of rugby league, but because they've got a bit of a process and a system, and Gus has said he's come out, it's we're developing these guys for something. The fruits are coming now, and they're seeing all that, all the work and effort that they've put into over the last eighteen months, and putting on show the football that they're playing. It's uh, it's enormous. Just a moment for me. Kyle Weeks' tackle on kick out oh, oh, on yeah. the try line. <laughs> I thought kick out was in for all oh, money. What a <laughs> body on the line. Body on the line, gets the ball out. Big, big tackle by the young fella. Yeah, enormous. That was like the one that Trey Fuller made on Joseph Tarpanier uh, yes. about a month ago. Yep. Knocked himself out but stopped a certain <laughs> try. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's uh, all the games for the weekend, eh? Some, some mean games, eh, Adam? Wrap it up, eh? 
Well, Fano, another beautiful episode here on Run It Straight. Uh, round 22, all the magic, all the talking about every single team. Our Warriors fans, it's all up there for you guys. And um, all the very best to all those NRL teams that we spoke about and every single player on the field. Make sure you like, subscribe, tune into our channel, tell your friends, go over to our socials, TikTok, Instagram, whatever you have, wherever you want to listen to us, tell your friends. That's another beautiful episode of Rugby League here on Runner Straight. Let's go.